And good morning, everyone, and welcome to Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd here at Triple H 100.1 Studios in Hornsby. I'm very excited to be welcoming a special guest today all the way from Melbourne. He didn't bring good coffee with him, unfortunately, which is rather disappointing. <laughs> welcome to the program, Warren. Thanks very much, Alexi. Now, Warren, you are, of course, let me make sure I get this title because it's always very long when we're talking to people in the government sector, yep. Executive Director of Assessment Intelligence at ASIC. That's right. Right. But we're here to talk about small business we today. We are here to talk about small business. Which I'm, um, I'm looking forward to speaking about because quite often with guests and people chatting on social media, there's a lot of questions around what, what, what is the role of ASIC and, and how do they support small business? How do they make sure we're doing the right thing, of course, which is mostly uh, what government agencies need to do for us. And, and I guess sometimes we think of um, government agencies as a bit untouchable up in the ivory towers, lording over, but it's, it, things have very much changed these days. You're out and about, you're talking to people. In, in fact, just before the news you were mentioning out there that um, you get out there and particularly to regional yep. festivals, you Absolutely. want to talk to small business. Absolutely. And that's a big thing of what we want to do. We want to go out and engage with small business. So yeah. there'll be a lot of people saying, well, we never see them, we never hear from them. Well, you know, we are out there. You know, we are out in regional Victoria. We are out in the outer parts of, you know, capital cities. You know, we are trying to talk to people and see what the issues are for them so that we can go and change our programs and do other things to support them better. And that's what you can do because, of course, you're bound by the legislation that you are administering, much like the ATO when they come on the program. They have to just administer whatever's handed down to them from politicians and legislators. And you're in the same boat. You're just um, controlling and working what the parameters that they set. Oh, um, I, I, look, I, I would agree. Mm. Um, and that's when people want us to do certain things or there are certain uh, things that business is required to do. But we would say we take even a, a, a wider view of what we can talk to people about and what we can support them with and give them indicators about. So people will come to us and say, I'm getting involved in business with somebody. How do I check them out? What do I? What, what can I do to find out about them? Mm. And sure, we're, we're, we're bound by how much we can tell people mm. and there's a limit that's available on our public registers. But we want to tell them how to help themselves. So we're not bound by the law in that respect. We really want to go and talk to people about those things. So it's very, very much uh, one-way information. You're really looking to sort of support in the, in, the, in the way of giving advice out there Absolutely. on the effect of basically running a business. Let's talk top line now. So ASIC's responsibility with small business, how do you interact with them just broadly? What is your role when we function as a small business day to day? When you function as a small business, ASIC's at least the first place probably you'll come into contact with, certainly if you've got a business name or you've registered a company. So we are the corporate regulator that deals in business names and companies. So all of your registration details, change of address, all of those types of things, putting in your annual returns, for company purposes, will all come to us. Uh, And those are important things that actually make business in Australia happen. So there's about, I think, 2.8 million uh, companies now in Australia. There's nearly the same amount of business names in Australia. Um, so virtually every Australian small business will have contact with ASIC, uh, but it's more than that. Um, we're also the regulator where if a company goes into external administration, so a form of administration or liquidation, we're the company that registers all the liquidators or administrators that deal with those companies and make sure that they play by the rules, right. play by the law as well. So there's a whole range of things that ASIC's involved in is, is, in terms of small business in Australia. It's almost like at every part of the life cycle of small business you're involved in, from the very moment of the thought of setting up and this idea in your head with the name, all the way through to, I guess, succession planning as well. You support in that arena with the handover or the sale or or even the death of a business, all those things. We, we say we are cradle to grave in terms of some small business activities in Australia, you know. Um, when businesses are started, predominantly a lot of them in these days now are small proprietary limited companies. So we're there at the birth of that business and unfortunately we're there often at the death of that business, be it in good times or bad. There are lots and lots of businesses that close in Australia for good reason. The people have decided they don't want to do that business anymore. They've moved on to another business. They just um, have made the money they want in that business and they don't need to continue it. Mm. So there are plenty of reasons why businesses end, rather than using the death analogy. Um, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of reasons why businesses end that don't have to end in a bad way. Yeah, and, and we want to talk to people about that as well. Yeah, and the successes as well as the, the Absolutely. difficulties. Absolutely. So let's talk about that beginning point because um, a few years ago uh, ASIC took over for the centralised business name yep. re- register. Wasn't it painful when it was state by state? 
state? Yes, it was. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Were you still administering that or was each state No, it was each it? state. And, I mean, we were talking to the state regulators, um, which and it was various different regulators across each state. And so um, in my home state of Victoria, um, you could have a business that was in Mildura, which is right up in the top corner of Victoria, and it... If it was set, because it was so close to the South Australian border and so close to the New South Wales border, it would take the effort to register business names in three states. And that was just ridiculous. I mean, the amount of red tape that that caused for small business was crazy. So mm. the great thing the states all decided to do was refer all those powers up to ASIC um, so that we had one national program of business names. And ASIC's had a history of that. In fact, the Corporations Act itself is... Um, the first instance where there was, again, that referral of state powers uh, in this space to the federal um, arena, and that was companies. So it used to be there was a state-by-state companies approach in Australia about 26 years ago, and the states all agreed to refer those powers to what is now ASIC, and so there is one national company register as well. So 20-odd you know, years later, we get business names as well. So we look after both of those, and it makes it a lot easier for business. And the great thing about having it in a centralised place is you can search the database to make sure that nobody else has the name, and, and obviously duplicates can't be created. But we should note at this point for those of you who are at that setup phase and those of you who maybe haven't checked this, it doesn't necessarily mean that your IP is protected in any way. You haven't trademarked a name just because you've registered it. That's right. So, so you ab- have to be careful of that. A- absolutely. A business name doesn't give you exclusive trading rights or ownership over that name, actually. So what we say to people is make sure you also do searches for registered trademarks and similar because there might not be a business name of a particular type that you're looking for, but there may be a trademark. Mm. And so there's some in, you know, instances we've seen where there's been those problems and you, you know, unfortunately could then face some legal action or have to resort to legal remedies to sort that out. Yeah. We do a lot of work when, if once you've registered a business name though, when new people come along and apply for a business name that might be the same, that, that's knocked out. We, we, it, they can't do it. However, we do have rules around sufficiently similar business names and we don't want to, we, we try to do a lot of work to avoid that. We also do a lot of work to avoid crude and other names as well <laughs> that people sometimes come to us and I won't run through some of those <laughs> but we'll knock those out as well. And we've had a couple of cases where we've had to knock people out because they keep pushing the, the boundaries of what the names of businesses are. But sufficiently similar business names, you know, we'll knock those out, you know, but we, we have to make, you know, some rules about that. And, you know, my favourite example is fish and chips. Okay, so I assume nobody can own the words fish and chips or fish and chips by itself. No, yeah. And so what we do is we see fish and chips. You know, Hornsby. We see fish and chips Waitara, and people say, "Well, hang on, they're just down the road from each other, and they've got our name." Well, so you you find these add on words go on, and we will allow that. But it's a tricky area. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. But we do a lot of work to try and make sure the same business name is not um, uh, issued by us and. Effectively, we have computer programs that sort that out, but we also have, uh, uh, you know, those that look sufficiently similar, they get uh, taken offline and we go and look at them, you know, uh, name by name. Is that fairly similar to what you would have with the process with a private ruling through um, something like ATO, for example? There's not a formal private ruling process like there is with the ATO, but we do have people who will write to us after they've been knocked back and make... Um, submissions about why that name is okay and we will consider that and in some circumstances we have let those through. Let's talk about the way ASIC um, administers small businesses um, at the pointy end, at the not so not so pleasant end. So um, why would ASIC be also chasing uh, the small business for doing irregular or Im- improper things as well as the big boys? I mean, I think this is where we can sit there and go, oh, the big boys are doing such, the corporates are doing such evil things. There's such evil big corporations out there. That's who you should be chasing. Um, why broadly is it that ASIC also tries to improve the, the small business community? Why, why are you even involved in that community? It, 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 it's a great question. Um, I, I think anyone listening you know, who's in business would know that it's not just the big end of town that can do bad things, it's the small end of town as well. And in fact, to answer your question more directly, it's because small business expects us to. Um, they pay annual fees, annual review fees. They expect that we are out there identifying bad actors, those people who are doing bad things to other small businesses. And predominantly um, the things that hurt good small businesses are, are bad small businesses. So we need to go and look at those businesses and try and correct... Our initial approach is trying to correct the problem, 
try to get compliance, get people to do the right thing, and then we escalate past that. And if we have to, then, you know, there are the formal steps like prosecutions and criminal charges we can bring or civil injunctions we can bring if we have to. Um, so we will look at those things. Similarly, we look at our directors just ha- behaving badly on a, you know, a systemic or regular basis. So if you've been involved in two or more companies that have gone into liquidation and you owe money, we have the ability to disqualify you from being a director for up to five years. I was going to ask you about that, actually. Is this how you um, work a little bit with the ATO? Because a lot of people are used to um, complaining about businesses doing the wrong thing, particularly around phoenixing, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the show. Great. Um, but is this where the ATO can refer people and complaints to you when they see that it's part of ASICs? Ab- absolutely. We, sh- we share information with the ATO daily, uh, about these things and they are identifying to us people that they think we should look at. Similarly, we are referring people to them that we think they should look at. Mm-hmm. Um, we have formal meetings, you know, in, in relation to some of the big task force areas that we've got, like Phoenix, which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we get that information from the ATL. We get information from a lot of other places too. The Fair Work Ombudsman um, will often refer work to us. We've taken prosecutions against directors on the basis of information from the ATO, from Fair Work Ombudsman, from the ACCC. Um, at least at the federal level in some states I can't name an agency that hasn't referred information to us that we haven't taken action on. So it can be a bit of a trickle down effect if you're found to be really badly in breach of one thing Um, it's often that those sort of businesses that are giving the rest of us a bad name are in breach of a whole bunch of other things yeah, as well. Yeah, and, 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 and the, the, there's a whole range of things there. I mean, if, if, a, if a business is, and a director of a business has been um, prosecuted, say, by the Fair Work Ombudsman, they'll often let us know about that because then we can consider whether or not we need to do something as well. Mm. So it might be that, you know, that that's an indicator of other bad performance in other businesses the person's been involved with, and the public would expect that we would do something to stop them starting business again. So, so if, we look at that. So that's a good interesting interesting question because if fair work is going to find somebody who's really badly in breach you know of of like really perhaps across the board they're underpaying employees and yep. taking advantage possibly even implementation of slavery which is a topical subject at the moment um does that mean they have the power to shut that business down or does that referral come to you and you're the ones who have the power How yeah does it work uh, they that? don't have the power and right. that's one of the reasons why we have very close working relationships with an organization like fair work ombudsman mm. so um, that's our job and they refer those matters to us. I mean, we think that um, we'll get to a point where, in fact, a place like the Fair Work Ombudsman should be able to approach a court for orders shutting down a business in those circumstances if it's been so bad mm. um, or repeated that the court should consider that that person shouldn't be running a business anymore and that business should not continue to operate. But as it stands at the moment, those things, that's why the Fair Work Ombudsman refers matters to us and often it's why the ATO refers matters to us as well. So the ATO has the ability to have a company wound up, put into liquidation, um, but often in terms of the actions against the directors, that's for ASIC to do and the ATO will refer those matters to us and we'll have a look at it. On the other side of things, do you similarly have a very good working relationship with um, the Small Business Ombudsman who represents small business and all the professional associations as well? Do you work together with them when you're creating changes or or implementing new policies? Yep. So, in fact, um, uh, I don't think it's a state secret, but there's actually a formal working party that meets three or four times a year that's led by Kate Carnell, the Australian Small Business and Family Owned Enterprises Ombudsman, which is attended by... The ATO, the ACCC, uh, Fair Work Ombudsman, ourselves. Oh, to be a fly on the wall at oh, that and, and look, and they're good discussions because yeah. um, we, it's a very robust and open discussion and what you'll find is the Ombudsman will say to us, these things aren't working well or we can road test an idea with the Ombudsman and say, well, what do you think about that? We, we want to do this program because we think that's going to help small business or that's going to take out the types of actors you don't want to see or this is the way we're going to apply new laws and we get great feedback. Now, that meeting is really interesting because twice a year all of the state small business commissioners are there as well and we have a really big discussion about what we can do to better support business. So you get the people who, if you like, from agencies such as mine who have to take action, you know, for misconduct, but you also get those uh, uh, 
organisations represented, such as the State Small Business Commissioners, were saying, well, hang on, businesses have got these pressures on them, you need to take that into account. Right. So they're really good discussions for us. And here's a little practical strategy for those of you who are listening out there as small businesses. Get on to the newsletter for the Small Business Commissioners, uh, sorry, the Small Business Ombudsman, Kate Carnell, and also for the New South Wales Small Business Ombudsman as well. They will update you regularly on what happens in these meetings. And if you think that something's a little bit askew or something hasn't been considered, you have as much of a voice, a voice as anybody else. We are all equal in the small business world. And talk to your professional association. Ask them, are they communicating with the ombudsman? Are you, is your voice as a, as a, I guess, a community of businesses being heard as well and being considered? It's just something that you can do from an advocacy point of view for your own um, sector of the small business community and for yourself. We're going to take a quick break here on Small Biz Matters. And when we come back afterwards, we're going to talk to Warren a little bit more about um, the common issues that uh, small businesses face and um, mistakes that they make and maybe something that you might want to consider when running and structuring and moving on with your business. You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll be back after this. Now, today we are talking to Warren Day from ASIC all about how um, the Australian Securities Investments Commission deals with small business. Just before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the setup process and the way the names index um, is, uh, is a great place to start to make sure, A, that your name isn't taken, but also you need to check out your trademark. So have a listen to that segment of the show if you missed any of it. We also discussed how the ASIC and ATO and all the government bodies interrelate with one another when making policy decisions, but importantly, how they interrelate with the ombudsmans and um, the support network that small business has as well. So there is communication going on. Don't worry, people. If you're not sure about it, subscribe to some newsletters and find out what's happening. And if you're not happy about what's happening, then make sure your voice is heard. So let's talk about um, the way that small business has difficulty with the powers that ASIC uh, controls when it yep. comes to registrations. Yep. So, um, the, you know, we mentioned registrations at the beginning of the program that, you know, if a name's already registered, you might need to consider changing it or, you know, you can give you guys a call, I assume, yep, if there's absolutely. a problem. Find out what regulatory um, limitations there are when you're setting up a business in that regard. Yep. What are the problems and issues do you typically see happen at small businesses, the mistakes they make, for the, the mistakes they make, um, you know, are, are generally not keeping proper books and records. So that's one of the hardest things. I think people get into business, they want to just get started. If you like, they want the money coming in. But actually having adequate books and records about what you're doing is so important. And it becomes important because if problems happen later, someone can work out why it happened. Mm. But more importantly, you know what's going on. And it's such a fun, it, you think it's such a vanilla thing to say, it's such a motherhood thing to say, but not keeping books and records is like the number one thing. But can I play devil's advocate here and say, what? why does that matter to ASIC? I mean, it matters obviously to the ATO, it matters to fair work because of payments and, and you guys do interact with one another. Yep. But how does that impact on our relationship with ASIC not having good I, I think it, 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 there's two ways to answer that. There's a the, the fact of the matter is, if you're keeping good books and records, you know whether your business is going well or not, and you can mm. make mature, informed decisions about how your business is travelling. And what we see is people just making ill-informed decisions about what's going on with their business. A perfect example is, if the business isn't travelling well, if you haven't got the books and records, you don't know. You've, you may have a sense of it, you may have you know a, a gut feel that, oh, no, we're making money, but you don't actually know. You know. Until you've seen it written down, it's like a lot of things, until you've seen it written down, you don't know. So there's that's one way. Uh, and that's important to us because it means the businesses you're trading with, and generally, you know, you're always you know, someone supplying you, you're supplying somebody else. They, you know, it's in their interest that you're a good performing business, that your business is performing well. If you don't have books and records, you're not. Mm. We're also interested because then if things go wrong, we can work out what happened. Because, you know, the other businesses you've been dealing with, who if the thing, you know, falls over and goes into administration, other businesses will say to us, well, you ASIC, tell us why this happened. What, what was the reason for this happen? There's no books and records we can't tell. In fact, and it's, offen it's an offence under the Act not to keep good books and records. Oh, under so the uh, Act that you... Absolutely. A failure to keep proper books and records is an offence and we will prosecute and do prosecute, you know, 20, 30 times a year for those types of things in court. So, you know, we will do that. Um, not notifying us... Another mistake is not notifying us when your company details change. Change of address, change of registered business office, postal address... Uh, change of directors, all of those things virt nearly all have to be um, notified to us within 28 days. If you don't, um, effectively you'll get um, a fine, and our fines aren't small, um, but you'll get a fine. It's an easy thing to avoid. 
Um, most people register their details or lodge documents through their accountant or through their lawyer. It's not hard. You've just got to make the effort and keep them up to date. But it, it, importantly, it's still your responsibility Absolutely. to make sure. So if you've told your accountant your new address and you maybe haven't, haven't implicitly said, we need you to update these with ASIC, yep. you would assume they would. But, but, they, oh, but I can tell you, if I had a dollar for every time someone complained about the fact they got a late fee and it was their accountant's job and their accountant didn't do it, mm. um, I wouldn't be working for ASIC. I'd be you know, on a beach somewhere. Um, the reality is a lot of people leave it to their accountant, expect it's going to get done, doesn't get done, get the fine, and then they ring us if it's, as if it's our problem. And the answer is it's not. Ultimately, so it's your it's, responsibility. It's your responsibility. You, you, you don't get to you know, put that to somebody else. So you've got to make sure it happened. But is, is, the, is realistically, is the small business owner out there who hasn't got the competence or maybe the ability to run their director's meetings and their, and their minutes and, and even the process of re-registering the business name, mm-hmm. um, they're giving that to their accountant because they're assuming... Yeah, it's, the same it's, like, it's, yeah. it's a real business issue. Yeah. It's about, I give it to this person, I want the service, I trust that they'll do it, and if they don't... You know, it's not my fault. Yeah. Well, that's it doesn't actually work that way. But you know that I acknowledge that you know that's an issue that you say. Well, I left it to my accountant. Surely that's an excuse. The law doesn't see it that way. Absolutely. The law just says the buck stops with you. So, so let's let's talk about a pr- practical solution. There is that when you are on an annual basis reviewing, say for example, your insurances. Yes. Also, sit down and include in your mind the ASIC registration of your business name in that process. Yep. And make sure that all of your fees are up to date, and maybe even make a diary note of when those insurances uh, are, uh, that particular fee is going to uh, come Absolutely. Out. Now, the interesting thing to know is if you're using your accountant, we will send reminders to your accountant saying this thing's coming up. Now, for those businesses who don't use the accounts, and this is not me saying do or don't use an accountant, that's not what I'm saying, mm. but if you don't, then you get those alerts. So if you believe you're not getting what you need, talk to your accountant about it and change the alert service so that it can be over to you and talk to your accountant and they can help you with that. However, if you've never used an account, you don't need to worry, those alerts will come to you. But I agree with you, Alexi, that um, simple things such as using a diary, writing down reminders about when these things are due is just good business practice. Again, it's part of books and records. And a lot of accountants and bookkeepers will um, put those particular fees into a, their own specific account called filing fees. Yes. And then you can see when the regularity of those pop up into your profit and loss and you can see when that timing is and, and then it might prompt you as well to make sure that you're keeping it up to date. The last thing I'll say about that is it's amazing um, the number of people who come to me and complain about their accountant in this space. And I say to them, well, you know, you, they're supplying you Maybe it's time you think about a new accountant. Yeah, and th- and those are things people have to think about as part of that. Can I can I talk about some other mistakes? Absolutely. Um, uh, using company funds for personal use. Mm. So certainly now that we have a number of companies on our register that have single directors, like so only one director. Um, it used to be years ago the rule was you had to have a minimum of two. Now you can have a company, a small proprietary limited company with only one director, and you get a, a view that this is my money, this is this is effectively my stuff. And the answer is it's not. It's the company's. Yes, you might be the sole shareholder. Yes, you might be the sole director, but it's the company's money. The company is a legal entity. It has its own obligations. So you need to remember that company funds aren't to be used willy-nilly for personal use. There are processes to pay yourself dividends out of the company, to draw a wage out of the company. People need to understand that, and they commonly don't. They blend it as if it's their own, and that causes all sorts of problems. And quite frankly, that could lead to things such as theft. If you, it's A company is a legal entity. So if you're even if you're the director and shareholder and you're just taking money out when it suits you, depending on the circumstances, you could actually face, you know, criminal charges of theft if you do that. Wow. So, you know, it's serious stuff. Mm. Majority of people, they'll never run into that problem and they might make it up later, those types of things. That's still no excuse. So just remember, company funds are not your funds. They're not for personal use. Um, and we see so many companies uh, and individuals running companies get into bad you know, shape, bad places, because they're just missing that m- missing that real key thing. And I can hear a lot of you is pricking up there going, oh, hang on, I do have a credit card that I pretend is all about business, but I put a whole lot of personal transactions on there. Mm. Stop doing that. That's just right. stop it. Absolutely. <laughs> Apart from the fact that it's taking you extra time to sort out what's personal and what's not, start treating your business funds and your business activities Activity as a very separate yeah. thing. And it gets down to also, if nothing else, you don't get a clear look at how that business is performing. So this is why it goes back to this conversation at the start there, Alexi, between you and I, um, about the laws and we're stuck, you know, we're controlled by the laws. Yes, the laws say you shouldn't do that because potentially that's theft. 
right? But at the same time where we sit, we just want good business practice. And good business practices don't blend those things so that you know how well or not this business is actually going. We see that as really, really important. Mm. You know, don't worry about the stick, you know, response of, um, you know, you might go to jail. Look at the carrot response, which is I'm doing this because I actually want to know how much money I'm making or not so I can make mature business decisions. And everything about what we, we do in this space really comes back to we want to see business making good, sound business decisions on based on good information. And that's where the books and records, not blending your personal funds with your company funds is just so important. So let's talk about other mistakes that directors tend to make. Um, you mentioned fair work. Obviously, there's all, a whole lot of legislation we could spend an entire program talking about when it comes to... Um, underpaying or incorrectly paying your employees, including yourself, people. Like we were just saying, you are a separate entity. You need to treat yourself as an employee and make sure you're paid appropriately. Same as your partner, same as your anybody else involved in the business who's a family member, they still need to be treated appropriately. What other mistakes do you see from an ASIC point of view? Uh, look, I, I just want to talk about family members or friends and family issues. And we see that one of the most common uh, complained of things that ASIC receives is two people who got into business, let's say five years ago, both became directors of a company and now hate each other. <laughs> it's, it, 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 literally, we would get a thousand you know, complaints about that a year. And, you know, you get these really interesting, really Mexican standoff situations where, you know, person A says person B has taken money and bought a car and person B says person A has taken some money and gone on a holiday and you ASIC need to sort it out. Now, I don't think the taxpayers of Australia would think that we should waste our time with that type of dispute. But it's so common that people write to us about that circumstance. And what that says to me is, have a again, have a really good business plan, have a really good idea of what you're trying to do. Don't blend and allow you know, private funds and company funds, you know, to blend across because I would say in the circumst- in, the, in the sort of story I just gave before, that's what's happened that's led up to that. They've all turned a blind eye when people are just using money for our, their own purposes. Um, but have a think about who you're getting into business with because we get that a lot too, that people don't like the person they're in business with now. What? Yes, it was a good idea three years ago, but now it's not a good idea. So a commonly complained about problem is who they're in business with. And the answer is we won't go and mediate that. We don't provide mediation services. Mm. We won't give you legal advice. What we will recommend you do is go and get some legal advice or go and get some mediation. Yeah, I was going to ask that. It's, it's, it's very much becomes a legal issue when you're trying to extract yourself out of a business relationship that is formal because it's a company structure perhaps yep. um, and the two of you are directors, that's a formal structure that you need to extract yourself from. So yep. legal is the way to go down. And, well, legal, and, and the thing I would um, give a bit of a shout out for is not legal, go and get a lawyer and then start writing nasty letters to each other. I would say legal in terms of and not enough businesses, and certainly when it's a family business, um, don't do enough to actually go and get some mediation. Talk to your lawyer about mediation, about having a discussion, a very unemotional, um, calm, rational discussion about does this business, sh- should this business continue? Mm. As I said, because there are mature things you can do to separate your business, wind that business down maturely, and then go your separate ways without the need for wasting a lot of money in you know time in court, you know, lawyers' fees, those types of things. Sensible discussions will sort this out. But yeah, get some advice in the first place, but be looking for ways to resolve this, if you like, amicably, amicably and calmly. And talk to me about the the responsibilities of people who are directors. Is there a lot of confusion? I imagine there probably is, especially in the small business community. I mean, the reality is a lot of people who are set up as a company don't necessarily understand what their responsibilities are. Yep. It's They've done it for tax uh, effectiveness yep. and they're doing it to reduce their tax burden, but they're not really being, it's not really explained to them what their roles and responsibilities are as a director of a company. Yeah. Is that, um, where's the best place to make sure that you're aware of that that um, those roles yeah. and what you have to do. So I, I, I would challenge and say there are two reasons. One is tax for sure. Um, the other one is limited liability. Of course, yeah. Right. So you, you, if you've got a company, you know your, uh, you know if the, the company you know makes a mistake, does something wrong, effectively your personal assets aren't automatically you know uh, at risk. Right. So the limited liability that comes with being you know having your business run through a company is is good in that respect. Um, People really don't un- commonly don't understand their role when they become a director of a company. That's true. Um, we've put a lot of resources on our website. We have a small business hub on our website, and we've just updated a lot of that material there that talks about your role and legal obligations um, regarding the management of a company. Um, 
what we we say is people really need to understand and be fully up to date what's going on in that company. If you're a director, it's your job. And this and this is a, this is a rule that goes from the top end of town, from listed companies all the way down to the bottom. Is you have to be in control of that company and you have to know what's going on in that company. And again, that gets back to that books and records point. Um, but you shouldn't use your position as a director to cause detriment to the company or gain an advantage for yourself or someone else. So there are oftentimes people will use the company um, to exact an advantage for themselves, such as effectively um, pay themselves a salary they weren't due that wasn't approved by the company, those types of things. So you've got to be careful about those things. Um, Really it gets down to business decisions. If you're a director of a company, you've got to make business decisions in good faith and for a proper purpose. Um, and in the best interest of the company. It goes back to my example of two directors who now hate each other. You know, often, you know, giving yourself a car out of the company just because um, the other bloke, you know, went or the other woman went and, you know, took a holiday with it is not in good faith and not for the best interest of the company. It also goes to the point you were saying before about you disassociating yourself and you must understand that this is a different entity that's been created. It's got its own tax file number. Yep. Like it's a completely different... It is. It's a legal person. Yeah. It, under the eyes of the law, a company is a legal person by itself. It can own property. It can sell property. It can cause harm. You know, it can have it harm inflicted on it, mm. you know, and that's why it's a really important thing then to meet your obligations. Is it to, because it's been given this legal personality, there are all sorts of obligations, the law and therefore the community expects of you in running that company. And of course, when you get into the, the realm of having employees, that even gets more, um, I won't say litigious, but you've got even more roles and responsibilities oh, to direct. And, and that's it. The, the, the more things you take on, those other responsibilities go. And you know, government legislation, no matter what sphere we're talking about, is good at putting responsibilities onto that company. Um, so again, it, you know, one of the main things is keeping informed about the financial position of the company, um, ensuring your company can pay its debts on time. Because if you're not paying, if you're not able to meet your debts when they fall due and payable, you could be trading while insolvent. There are problems that can occur for you if that happens to the company. So one of the big things we want people to know is, um, is your company up to date with its payments? If it's not, you need to start to say, well, are we going to be able to meet our debts into the future? And if we're not, it's time to start taking some stock, probably take some advice from an accountant about, you know, am I in danger of trading while insolvent? You know, again, the test for that is, um, am I able to pay my debts when they fall due and payable? And you're not just talking about debts to the ATO or debts to the government. You're talking, talking about, about all debts. employees, superannuation, um, suppliers, yep. all that sort of stuff. A- absolutely the lot. You have to take the lot into account. And it's, you know, there are ways people can deal with that. So it might be you go and borrow more money. It might be that you bring in another investor to put some more capital into the business. Um, it might be that you restructure your debts, say with the ATO and other places, to make sure that you're in a better shape. But if you get into a position where you can't pay your debts when they fall due and payable, you are in danger of trading while insolvent and there are strict penalties for trading while insolvent. Moreover, the likelihood is the company is going to become in, uh, go into external administration with, say, an administrator or a receiver or a liquidator appointed really quickly and then things really get out of control. Who, do, who appoints – what's the process of that? Who appoints those liquidators? Uh, well, so there's, you know, I mentioned three types and there are three different types. So a receiver often is appointed by somebody who has a charge over your business, so pr- mostly the bank. Mm-hmm. So the bank will have a charge, you know, if you've got a loan from a bank, there'll be a charge over a house or a piece of property or some assets and they may appoint a receiver and that receiver's job is to go in and effectively collect those assets for the benefit of the lender, being that case being the bank. Um, so they're the people who appoint in that circumstance. The other two, administrator and liquidator, um, can be appointed by government agencies such as ASIC or the, oh, ATA, right. or the ATO, or the ATO so yep. that we can appoint liquidators if we need to um, through a court process. That's that's done through a court process. Um, but uh, often um, creditors will move to um, put a company into liquidation. The way they do that is they'll issue a statutory demand. So there's a formal process for that that the Corporations Act, which we administer, um, has, and that is the statutory demand's served on the company and they have, I think, 28 days to pay. And if they can't pay, that is um, basically proof that the company can't pay its debts when they fall due and payable. You can take that along to a court if you're the um, the uh, creditor and say, you know, Warren Day's business couldn't pay and the court can then make an order to put the company into liquidation. And in the case of small business, that's in small claims court? No, it's normally done in the lower division of Supreme Courts. 
Okay. So, you know, and this is it. A lot of businesses don't want to do that because there's a cost involved, mm. right? And they will often write to ASIC, you know, and say, this business is trading well and solvent and you should do something about it because we can wind that up. And we will wind up, you know, in that type of process, a number of businesses, probably, you know, 50, 60 businesses a year that way. But predominantly, we know the tax office may do it because in most situations where companies get into trouble, the biggest creditor by far, in fact, the biggest creditor in Australia of companies that um, fall into trouble is the ATO. Closely followed by superannuation in general. Absolutely. <laughs> no, and I mean, and employees, um, you know, entitlements and payments, uh, you know, the, the one just behind that. Mm. So, yeah, so, you know, you see those types of problems. So we really want to see um, directors get on top of their financial position. It, nearly everything that we see comes back to finance, I, I where are their finances at, where are their profit and loss at, where, you know, what's their balance sheet look like, and businesses just not understanding that. You know, the people who run the business don't understand that, and it's that type of thing that they need um, to increase the understanding and awareness of. So, you know, if you're if you're going to become a director and you want to know more about your responsibilities, as I said, our website and the Small Business Hub is a good place to start. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you, if you've been in business for a while but you want to know more about it because your business is getting bigger, um, there are lots of other places you can go for that type of information. Podcasts like this are a great thing. Um, but there's also the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Mm. So if you're getting interested in... You know, your business is getting bigger and bigger and how, how do I you know, meet those increasing responsibilities? Those types of places. I think also the Governance Institute's another place that runs training courses. Fantastic. Um, for directors in that space. So that's another place to go as well. Look, and just full of fantastic information. We're going to take a very, very quick break. And when we come back, we're going to wrap up with a little bit about um, the best way to deregister and close your business mm. in a voluntary capacity. You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. Alexi Boyd with Small Biz Matters. We'll be back after this. And welcome back to the studio here at Triple H. 100.1 FM, you are listening to Alexi Boyd with Small Business Matters. Small, I can't even say my own name. Small Biz Matters. And we are talking to Warren Day from ASIC, who is explaining in huge detail. If you've missed any of today's program, I highly recommend you go back to smallbizmatters.com.au and listen to the podcast in full. We have over 150 podcasts available on our website, plus over 70 on iTunes. There's a wealth of information there to educate yourself. And in five years, we have yet to repeat a topic because there's so much to learn particularly today about the role of ASIC and small business. Now, just before the break, you and I were talking about um, the typical mistakes Mm. we see small business directors make and where to go to get more help. And interestingly, where to go when you grow, because, um, you know, every business started small. Every director was a, was potentially a small group of directors and got bigger and bigger. Um, And how did they do that? And there's, there's definitely support networks out there to support you. Let's talk about the back end. Let's talk about um, voluntary um, closure of the yes. business first. Yep, the good thing. The good thing. Not the bad thing. So, like you said at the beginning of the program, you've chosen to wrap up your business. Perhaps yep. you're retiring or you don't really want to hand it over to anyone else and you're just wrapping things up. Um, is there a very clear place to go yep. to find out about the process? Yeah, and it's us. And we'll tell you all about it. So, if you want some information, generally, um, our website's a great place to start. Um, the process of deregistering a business, uh, effectively, I won't say winding up, I'll say winding down a business in an orderly fashion. Mm. Um, winding winding up is like, you know, bad things. We, we like to say winding down because it's like calming. <laughs> um, so um, if you want to deregister a business, go to our website. There's some great steps there how to do it. It's not that hard. And the short point is you can deregister the business um, with, um, you, have, you effectively uh, sign a declaration that there's uh, virtually no assets and certainly no debts left in the company. That's an important reason for one thing, and people need to understand this, is if a company is deregistered and there are assets left in it, ASIC controls them. Ooh. And so, in fact, we control all sorts of stuff at ASIC. Often we don't find out about it till later, but we literally own um, apartment towers, um, <laughs> trucks. trucks, cars, boats. I think there was even a stuffed polar bear we owned once. Telehandlers. Or you name it. We, yeah. we own lots. Of, we, we, we find out later that we own lots of stuff. So we do, and if that happens, just and I'm trying not to digress, um, we'll try and contact the former owners of the business and say, look, what happened to this asset? Um, often there'll be um, somebody who's owed that money. So banks sometimes still have a charge over a deregistered company and we'll talk to them. You know, we, we, we navigate a way around that. We've got a dedicated team who that's all they deal with every day. 
So the winding down. The, the, well, the, well the, 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 comp, the assets of companies that have been deregistered. Wow. We've got a time for that. Um, deregistration. So um, if your company meets certain criteria, you can apply for voluntary deregistration. Um, this effectively closes your company, removes your ob- obligations as a company office holder, and that's an important thing. I know a lot of people approach me and they say, oh, we stopped that business three years ago. But they've either paying fees or they've neglected to pay the fees in three years. Just avoid that. Just deregister the business. It's pretty straightforward. Um, You have to pay any outstanding fees, though, before you can apply for deregistration. So in that example, if you've let it, you know, eke on for three years but not paid the fees, we won't let you deregister it until you pay those fees. So the sooner you do it, the better. So simply to say I've ceased trading doesn't mean anything to ASIC. You no, actually have to actually Because if you're still on our books, if you're still on the register of companies, you've still got an obligation. Right. And that, and that means, you know, if you're the director of the company, it's in your interest to get that deregistered because you're still liable for anything that goes wrong in the meantime in that company. So the sooner you deregister it, the better. So our recommendation is um, at least two weeks before your annual review date, and that's a date when you pay us a fee, um, that's when you should be applying for deregistration at the latest. You should just get on with it and just do it. Um once it's deregistered, it's removed from the register of companies and it's unable to trade. That's an important thing to know. Once it's done, it's done. So get all the other affairs in order, do those types of things. Um, you can also wind up a solvent company. So if I go to my example of um, the two directors who now hate each other, what they can do is they can actually just wind up that business as a solvent company. They can take steps. They can appoint an accountant, if you like, to wind up that business for them. And it's like... Um, nearly like a a separation, like a divorce, so to speak. All the assets are called in, they separate that out, mainly in terms of money from a bank account of whatever's left over. They pay out all the debts, they just finish the estate and they pay it out. So there's a process for winding up a solvent company. And again, I could go on for hours about the legal niceties of that, but our website's got a good run through about winding up a solvent company Mm. as well. So deregistration, if there's nothing left in the company, is the more straightforward way to do it. Um, But if there are assets left, if there are liabilities left, there's a process of winding up that company as well. And it's on a voluntary basis. So there's no nastiness involved. It's paying out all the debts. Whatever monies are left are normally liquidated and then paid out to the shareholders. Obviously, this is quite a final finalisation of everything. So you do, you do need to make sure that everything's sorted and there's no reason why that entity may want to trade after the fact, even yeah. if you've removed all the debts and, and the creditors. You want to make sure that, you know... And I'm talking, yeah, it, 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 absolutely. Like, see, it's a circumstance where nothing else is going to happen in relation to that business or that company again. Mm-hmm. But So if it is within it, say, one of, the, one of the directors or one of the people involved with the business says, actually, there's something I want to continue to go on with, then there has to be a mature discussion about that so that... Um, they might decide, well, the company could trade on or, in fact, say the um, the brand name, the trademark, those things might be sold to that person um, in a new company so that it can continue on. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting because then we get into this area of Phoenix and, you know, Phoenix trading and people getting concerned saying, well, hang on, he's moved one business name to another. Isn't that a bad thing? There are lots of legal circumstances where people move the business name and the business operations to another company but there are lots of times when that's bad but again if, if the business is, is going to just end and that's it these are the processes you go through if it is that in fact something's going to survive afterwards then there needs to be a, a, a discussion about that some clear um, minutes of meeting of the company that will declare what's happening who's getting what assets what's going to happen into the future Let's talk about phoenixing because yep. that's um, something that you are very much holus bolus responsible for, um, obviously working with the ATO as well. But uh, by the by, you uh, that's basically where you find reprimanding small business. That's mostly where you're doing that, that yeah, process. Yeah. I, mean, right? uh, I mean, Phoenix, uh, f- the Phoenix and it, as a problem, we can talk about what is Phoenix activity in a sec, but Phoenix activity is effectively a, a small company problem. You know, and it's the uh, so if people say, well, give me a, a, a layman's example of what's Phoenix activity. So let's say there's a sofa shop, you know, in your area, and it's called Sofas R Us, and it's having problems meeting its debts, you know, it's having problems paying its workers, and it's also, you know, having trouble paying the ATO. And so what you'll see is it'll start up, you know, a kilometre down the road, and it's now called Sofas for You. Mm-hmm. And effectively what might happen is the employees start work down there and the equipment goes down there and Sofas R Us, the first company, just closes. And that's potentially a form of Phoenix activity. Um, and it might be where, so it's been done to avoid 
paying the ATO, being you know, paying its other creditors, uh, paying its debts, uh, avoiding paying employee entitlements. So, you know, those, those are not things the community wants to see. Uh, that is a form of Phoenix activity. Um, there, there isn't actually a, 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 an offence in the Corporations Act called "Thou shalt not Phoenix." Um, there's a whole range of things about obtaining property by deception. There's a whole range of things about um, uh, frustrating creditors, like so doing, making steps to ensure that your creditors can't be paid. There's a whole unfair preference. There's a whole range of laws around that that we apply. Um, and between us and the ATO predominantly, but the Fair Work Ombudsman and other agencies are also involved in this, these are the types of things we want to educate business about, right, educate business about, because a lot of those problems can be avoided um, if mature business decisions are made. Um, but what we do see is people doing this again and again and again, and those are the people we want to stop. Um, we'll disqualify them from being directors. We'll prosecute people um, for their unpaid taxes. Um, there's a whole range of things we can do to people in that circumstance. Do you find that um, it's still an unknown in the business community that it's not acceptable to wind up one company and declare bankruptcy or declare that you're unable to pay your debts and then set up exactly the same type? I mean, couldn't you arguably say, well, all I've ever done has been a plumber? and I'm going to wind up this business, and I'm sorry I made a few mistakes, I can't pay my bills, but I can only be a plumber, yep. so I need to set up another business as a plumber, otherwise I've got no skills. Yeah, and that, that, that's a great example. You know, we have that all the time. And the, the, the thing about this legal person you create in the form of a company, um, which is distinct from yourself, is it's employing you as the plumber, and the company's, you know, uh, effectively then insolvent, it goes into some form of external administration and that plumber sets up, as I say, you know, again under a different name. But you could go off and say, well, now I'm just going to be a sole trader. There's nothing Well, you could go and be an employee. Right. You know, you could go and work for somebody else. So there are other things you can do. But we need to understand that the, the position of companies and, and the role of companies is to allow entrepreneurial activity for people to run a business and there are a number of examples in society, in Australian society, of people who've had a business that went broke and then started up again, and then were a success. John Simon's, a, you know, Aussie Home Loans is a perfect example of that. The guy had a business that fell over. He, he, he talks about it. Mm. He, he's quite proud of the fact that he learned things, unfortunately, through that process, and that made him a better businessman as well. So it's not a crime to have a business that goes broke. It's not a crime of itself. Um, and there are lots of reasons why businesses actually fail. And they're not about bad deeds, they're often about poor bookkeeping. As we go back to that thing, it's about poor bookkeeping, poor books and records because you don't know what's going on in the business. It could be about economic downturn. So in your plumber's example, we're seeing this at the moment, if the Australian economy and, and people stop buying houses or stop renovating houses, there's less work for plumbers. Therefore, some plumbers are not going to be able to continue. You know, their businesses will be impacted by that. That's an economic condition situation. So those are legitimate reasons. Now, that's cold comfort to the people who've been you know, trading with that, it's probably cold comfort to the clients who probably got unfinished work. It's probably cold comfort to um, the suppliers who've been giving them, you know, the materials they need to do their job. It's probably cold comfort to the person who has got them on some form of lease plan for their vehicle. Or, you know, it, it, it's cold comfort to the ATO, which means the taxpayers of Australia. But that's the reality. And that's allowed to happen. And what's really misunderstood increasingly in the Australian community is that companies fail and yes, you'll be owed money, but no one will go to jail. You know, they, everyone, th everyone thinks, oh, the minute a company, you know, falls over, goes broke, someone has to get prosecuted. And if they don't, ASIC's failed in its job. And that's not the requirement here. So, you know, there is a way that businesses just fail. And if you want to set up another business, in fact, you might be able to. But if you do it twice, as I said before, if you're the director of a company that falls over twice... Well, maybe it's not for you. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, if we think there's problems in that and liquidate And so liquidators write us reports when a business falls over and tells us the reasons why a business has fallen over. Mm. And if they see misconduct in that business, then we will consider whether we need to take action. But if it's two or more companies, more often than not, we will disqualify you from being a director of a company in Australia. Well, look, today has been a wealth of information. We have covered so much. Anybody who's just started listening, make sure you check out the podcast available on iTunes or Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts or on smallbizmatters.com.au. I wanted to say thank you very much for coming on the program today because we have blank, roll and run out of time. There's just so There's much to, to chat about. I'm looking forward to having you back on the program. We can talk again about how ASIC interacts with small business. Now, where can people find out more information about small business? 
business in ASIC? ASIC.gov.au. If you get on the homepage there, you'll sm- see the Small Business Hub. The other thing is if you want to look at registers and registry, you'll see ASIC Connect. That's another button on the on the front page. Go and have a look at that. And, of course, there's the Money Smart website as well to assist with loads of information and, and about Yeah, we want business, business to look at its own financial capability, like actually your own bills. Forget about the business for a second. Look after yourself. So <laughs> moneysmart.gov.au. Look, thank you once again for coming on the program. You've been listening to smallbizmatters.com.au with Alexi Boyd. I'm looking forward to speaking to you all next week with another fantastic range of guests. Thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, we'll see you all on Triple H next Tuesday.